Everybody ready? For uh, four hours of reptile disease? I have a special interest in, in reptile diseases. I, I uh, have developed, I guess, a, a bit of a following in that regard. Also editing a two-volume uh, textbook on reptile diseases with, uh, along with Elliot Jacobson in the United States. Uh, and uh, hopefully we'll have that book out next year. Um, so I broke this into two different uh, segments. Uh, we'll do, uh, uh, non infectious diseases first, and then we'll do infectious diseases uh, to wrap up the day. And again, just like uh, this morning, if anybody has any questions or, or anything, just stop me. Uh, it's my understanding that we are not really uh, on a strict time schedule. Uh, and uh, don't, don't think twice about just asking me a question uh, as we go along. We'll start with uh, cardiovascular disease. Um, can you all see that up here? It's a little pale thing. You can see this all right? Okay. Is it, is, maybe if we turn the lights off better. Yeah, it's better. You're not going to go to sleep on me, are you? Put the lights down. Well, just like the mammals that we talked about this morning, uh, arterial sclerosis and atherosclerosis are a component of cardiovascular disease in reptiles. Uh, we also see uh, problems with uh, dystrophic mineralization involving the great vessels. Uh, hypertension appears to be a substantial problem in certain species of reptiles. And as a result of that, we, or perhaps as a uh, 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 a result of multiple factors, including hypertension, we also see aneurysms in the, uh, in the vessel walls of various species and in various locations. And then uh, it, with the aging process, uh, considerable cardiovascular, uh, or rather uh, uh, cardiac disease, degenerative cardiac disease. We'll start with the aneurysms. As you will hear in, this, in several of my uh, uh, segments of the talks today, bearded dragon, this, bearded dragon, that, bearded dragon, that, bearded dragons, we're going to this uh, is uh, a popular lizard in the pet trade. And unfortunately, there's been substantial inbreeding in these animals, and they have developed a number of different diseases that we see with considerable frequency. Uh, and which we don't see in other species of reptiles. One of the diseases that we see in bearded dragons is interesting, uh, is these venous aneurysms. Frequently this uh, will occur uh, right behind the eye, uh, or in the neck region, or over the top of the eye, result in a large hematoma uh, in that region. This is how it presents to the veterinarian. The veterinarian aspirates it, takes off all the blood, goes back down to normal or sort of normal, and then three or four weeks later, they're back to have it aspirated again. And that goes on and on and on until the, uh, you know, the owner gets tired of it, uh, and they put them down, or it ruptures and, and, and uh, they, they, uh, you know, they die due to him. The condition is sporadic in the bearded dragon. Uh, the pathogenesis is not understood, but I suspect that they have some kind of a collagen disorder in the vessel walls that is predisposing to the development of this, this lesion. Hypertension may also be contributing. In the bearded dragon, we see these lesions behind the eye, at the base of the heart, in the legs, and in the coliseum. Uh, we also see these aneurysms in snakes, uh, primarily at mid-body to coliseum in the aorta. Bearded dragon uh, with uh, 
large amount of hemorrhage actually hemorrhaged into the saloma cavity and died of the intrasalomic exsanguination. And after the blood is taken off and the liver reflected, uh, the, the aneurysm could be traced to uh, the descending aorta near the bifurcation of the iliac arteries. A uh, aneurysm occurring in the colosaloma cavity of a fox snake, uh, also uh, with likely within the a, within the descending aorta. Uh, by the time that these aneurysms cause death or the animal is euthanized, uh, there is so much hemorrhage, so much necrosis in the uh, vessel walls uh, that it can be difficult to determine the chronicity and actual location of the aneurysm. Degenerative cardiac disease is common in all of the reptiles. Uh, generally manifests as fibrosis or cumbarental fibrosis in the myocardium at the interface of the inner and outer muscular tunics. They have two muscular tunics in the heart, a spinal cord <coughs> tunic on the inside and a, and a uh, more solid uh, uh, tunic on the outside. And at that interface of those two tunics is where the fibrosis uh, originates. Previous cardiac disease or trauma may expedite the onset of degenerative change in the heart. By trauma, I mean perhaps previous blood draws from the heart. It is common to get blood from the heart of live reptiles in order to do hematologic examinations uh, because it can be difficult to uh, access a vein uh, in a reptile, either from the tail or uh, uh, in the sinuses of the neck. Uh, it can sometimes be difficult to get blood, so uh, getting blood from the heart has become a common, uh, a common procedure. There, uh, I might also add that there is a subset of what appears to be early onset fibrosis in the myocardium of the giant tortoise breeds, the Aldabra tortoise and the Galapagos tortoise. And, and that is uh, strictly an observation from our archives, uh, but uh, we see fibrosis, degenerative cardiac disease in these tortoises uh, in their second or third decades of life. And these animals, of course, can live you know, uh, up to 100 years, sometimes even longer. So to see that degree of fibrosis in a tortoise that age is, uh, is incriminating for some other kind of problem with the heart. In those animals with uh, degenerative cardiac disease, uh, there usually will be a chronic or long-standing uh, pericardial effusion. And that effusion causes the development of uh, uh, adhesions on the epicardial surface of the heart. And these adhesions can get quite substantial in size. And one of the most frequent questions that I get from other pathologists uh, after they have done a necropsy, they'll take a picture of one of these and they'll send it to me and they'll say, I've never seen this before, what is this? And what these things are is just uh, formation of fibrous adhesions and granulation tissue associated with chronic infusions. And it will cause an adhesion between the epicardial surface and the pericardial surface of the heart. And it's a fairly common finding uh, in these animals with degenerative cardiac disease. Uh, the, the cardiac fibrosis that I mentioned earlier uh, is present here. Uh, it's, it's a little more extensive in this case then uh, just occurring at the interface of the muscular tunics, but uh, this is all fibrous connective tissue extending along the fossil planes between the myofibers of the heart. We also see uh, a, 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 a fair amount of epicarditis and epimyocarditis associated with septic processes in, in reptiles. The heart seems to be uh, particularly targeted in those animals with sepsis. And in this particular case, uh, we have uh, uh, 
foci uh, hemorrhage associated with uh, bacterial embolization to the heart. Arterial sclerosis and to somewhat lesser extent atherosclerosis are common in, uh, in reptiles, especially in the lizards and snakes, and usually there'll be a thickening of the uh, vessel walls of the cardiac outflow tracts. Uh, these are, this is associated with a combination of arterial sclerosis and mineralization, this being a form of dystrophic mineralization in which uh, the degenerative changes in the heart are being followed by mineralization of the tunica media. With the onset of the mineralization and uh, arterial sclerosis, there'll be a attenuation or narrowing of the vessel lumen. And I think this lesion also will contribute, sub subsequently contribute to the fibrosis <laughs> that's occurring in the heart. Although not specifically a cardiovascular problem, it is a vascular uh, presentation. Uh, in aquatic animals, aquatic reptiles, we will occasionally see gas bubble disease or gas embolization. And this is usually associated with a pump failure. Uh, there'll be uh, a pump that is maintaining normal oxygen levels in the tank or ozone uh, levels in the tank. And when those pumps malfunction, uh, the water can become supersaturated, and these animals can uh, become uh, uh, or can develop gas emboli that get into the lymphatic channels and embolize everywhere. And in this particular case, this is a calibre tur uh, turtle that uh, has severe gas embolization. All these bubbles out here in the skin are actually lymphatic channels that uh, are filled with air. Remarkably, this animal survived. Uh, the uh, gas embolization events that occur in fish are usually uh, lethal, uh, but uh, the uh, reptiles appear to be slightly more resilient to the effects of gas embolization. The degenerative diseases in the reptiles uh, mirror those of the, of the primates that we saw that we talked about this morning. Uh, we see uh, degenerative renal disease, degenerative arthritis, cirrhosis, and uh, cataracts. Cirrhosis is common in the lizards, common in the tortoises, but not so common in the snakes. Uh, we particularly see a lot of cirrhosis in the bearded dragons and the iguanas. Again, the, the, the causes for cirrhosis in these animals is difficult to judge. Chronicity of the lesion uh, makes it impossible to determine what the underlying cause was in most of these cases. But aging, uh, obstructive processes of the biliary tree, long-term hepatoclipidosis, this is a common culprit in, uh, in some of the reptiles. Uh, or uh, exposure to hepatotoxins, it's very difficult to prove that one. But even a combination of those factors may contribute to the development of cirrhosis. Degenerative arthritis is, uh, is common in all species, but it's most prominent in the larger species, uh, the large tortoises, the large lizards, uh, the snakes, uh, we will see degenerative arthritis in the snakes, but possibly with a different pathogenesis. Uh, in, the, uh, in, in this particular case of the Komodo dragon, we have a uh, relatively severe uh, degenerative change in the articulations of the spinal column. Uh, and as with, as with uh, any other species, any any traumatic incident or infectious incident that targeted the joints may predispose it to uh, early onset uh, uh, degenerative arthritis as well. Anything uh, such as uh, nutritional bone disease uh, in which there has been 
uh, uh, mal uh, uh, malalignment of the joint due to uh, poorly developed uh, bone could also predispose to degenerative arthritis over time. In this particular case, Severe degenerative changes in the articulations of the vertebral column resulted in luxation, uh, partial luxation of the vertebral body over time, and this compressed the spinal cord. And of course, uh, this resulted in ataxia to the point where they eventually had to utilize uh, the lizard. Interestingly, we have several cases now in the archives. Uh, hypertrophic osteopathy, idiopathic hypertrophic osteopathy in lizards. Uh, this affects all of the long bones and is associated with prominent subperiosteal uh, hyperostosis. The cause so far for this disease has not been determined. In mammals, it is usually associated with some form of intrathoracic or intra-abdominal mass, either a tumor or an abscess or so forth. Uh, but in the reptiles thus far, uh, I have not been able to make any correlation uh, between the development of this hyper uh, hyperostosis and a visceral lesion. Radiographic image showing the marked reactive bone formation that is occurring in the long bones. This is disease primarily of lizards, and uh, particularly uh, monitor lizards. And then the iguana, uh, the green iguanas, have a form of ascending uh, hi uh, hyperostotic hyper uh, lesion that involves the, the vertebrae and progresses to ankylosis, spondylosis, and subperiosteal hyperostosis. Uh, and it seems to start in the tail and then gradually moves all the way up the vertebral column and involves the entire salonic vertebral column as well. And uh, it will eventually get quite severe and with any manipulation or falling from a perch, then that uh, ankylosis uh, location could fracture, and once it fractures, then the uh, spinal cord uh, becomes displaced or severed, and, and they become uh, paralyzed. An interesting uh, finding: this box turtle. This, this is a eastern box turtle indigenous to the United Eastern side of the United States. This box turtle was found by a biologist and it had holes in the shell right here, right here, right here, and right here. Symmetrical shell holes in the carapace, uh, front and back. And the question was, well, why are those there? And because it's so symmetrical, did somebody do that? You know, the human did punch holes in the animal to, to, to identify it. Uh, are they bite wounds? from a predator. So uh, this was looked at pretty closely. And uh, this is an old box drill. It turns out that this is a very old box drill. And it just so happens that the articulations of the scapula with the carapace right there and with the pelvis right here. And over time, the sole turtle wore right through its carapace. Chronic renal disease is common in all reptiles, uh, and of course, uh, age and previous renal insults are likely contributing factors. In reptiles, in contrast to mammals, when we talked about bilateral uh, asymmetrical shrinkage of the kidneys and so forth this morning, in reptiles, uh, chronic renal disease usually is associated with an enlargement of the kidney because there is more deposition of urates, there's more fibrosis, tubules become more dilated, and this results in an overall increase in the size of the organ. And with that, uh, we, we see uh, 
some additional problems. This is the colon. These are the testicles. And these are the kidneys of a normal arm. We have reflected the, uh, some of the body wall here to expose the, uh, the pelvic canal. And I might note to you, because this is important, especially for clinicians, that the kidneys in lizards are way back in the caudal saloma cavity, essentially in the pelvic canal. And that's important because the testicles are frequently mistaken for kidney at necropsy of lizards. So this creates problems when the animal presented clinically with renal disease, you finally have to put it down, you want to know what kind of kidney problems it had, and then you see, when you open it up, you see these things, and you think those are the kidneys, and, and you don't save the kidney, then we can't help. This, trust me, happens a lot. So that's why I point that out now. Kidneys and lizards are way back in the saloma cavity. So, back to my original uh, line of thought. Normal-sized kidneys in the iguana and pathologic changes in the, in the kidney of an iguana due to a combination of fibroplasia, uh, gout, mineralization. Note what happens. The renal parenchyma becomes enlarged pushes in on the colon, and then they get constipation or obstipation associated with that lesion. So it's an obstructive lesion in addition to uh, uh, a lesion of the kidney itself. Histologically, uh, a lot of fibrosis, disruption of the uh, renal parenchyma, uh, there will be uh, concurrent uh, uh, uric stasis and uric tophi, which I'll talk about in a moment. That brings us into the deposition disorders, which are very important in reptiles, major causes of disease. We'll start with uh, gout. Thought we were going to start with gout. All right. Well, we'll start with <laughs> we'll start with mineral. And then we'll do gout. <coughs> okay, so uh, the major problem uh, with uh, mineral deposition in reptiles is uh, metastatic mineralization. And that's going to be uh, either due to uh, underlying renal disease and associated derangements in calcium metabolism or derangements in dietary calcium and phosphorus balance. Uh, and especially common uh, is the oversupplementation of vitamin D, which results in. Uh, hypervitaminosis need, and subsequent metastatic mineralization. This process is especially common in the herbivorous lizards, much less common in uh, the snakes and chelonians. Affected tissues can be in great vessels, Kidney, lung, gut, and skin. This is a radiograph of the uh, a lateral aspect of the body wall in a iguana. I want to point out this structure here, which is the descending aorta. And the reason that it's opaque is because it is extensively mineralized. <coughs> Corresponding lesion in this case is this pattern of nodularity within the wall of the, of the uh, aorta. This aorta could essentially be snapped if it's so mineralized. And of course, it does have, it has no more elasticity, uh, so there's going to be problems with perfusion associated with that free mineralization in the aorta. This, this is just the kidney showing areas of mineralization in the real parenchyma of the kidney associated with metastatic mineralization. Not, not, not underlying renal disease, uh, rather, mineralized, uh, rather uh, renal manifestations of metastatic mineralization. 
This is a tortoise uh, that uh, has uh, been, uh, unfortunately, the victim of metastatic mineralization. And looking through the cirrhosis side of the, of the stomach, you can see all of these coalescent foci of uh, white discoloration and nodularity. These uh, correspond to uh, extensive mineralization of the mucosal surface of the stomach. And an image that I particularly like, this is a bearded dragon with metastatic mineralization. And you'll note that both lungs are expanded. They're still inflated. <laughs> and the reason they're inflated is because the interstitium is all mineralized and it's lost its ability to expand and contract. And, it, uh, and they stay inflated as a result of the mineralization. And of course, there's going to be a major ventilation perfusion mismatch associated with mineralization throughout the interstitium of the lung like this. Uh, noteworthy also is the liver in this animal has uh, cirrhosis. Histologically, uh, the mineralization associated with metastatic mineralization in the kidney will involve the basement membranes of the tubules. This is a tubule here. And then the basement membrane on which the epithelial cells rest uh, is all mineralized all the way up. It also has some renal tubular mineralization, beginning to develop a little bit of uh, renal gout as well. Uh, but the basement membrane mineralization is typically a feature of uh, metastatic mineralization. Along those lines, this is a section of skin, this is the dermis, uh, this is the dermis, this is the epidermis. At the interface of those two is the basement membrane on which the epidermis rests. And the basement membrane is extensively mineralized. Now, in this particular image, the epidermis is still on top of the, of the dermis. But, over time, the epidermis will begin to lift off of the dermis and form a vessel. And the, to the clinician, this looks like a blister. Uh, and it used to be called blister disease, but in fact what it is is mineralization of the basement membrane of the epidermis associated with metastatic mineralization. So, a biopsy, uh, to a pathologist, a biopsy of this tissue right here uh, tells a pretty deep story uh, and it, it implies a full prognosis because of the pattern of mineralization that is present. Also, along with the basement membrane mineralization, there'll be much mineralization of the muscular tunics of the heart. In this case, uh, the uh, inner uh, muscular tunic. Iguanas have an interesting uh, clinical presentation as well. They sometimes will present with a regenerative erythroid response in the peripheral blood, but with an absence of anemia. Pack cell volume will be normal, maybe even elevated a little, and they will have a, a pronounced uh, regenerative erythroid response. And when I first saw this, I thought, oh, this has got to be some kind of leukemia, erythroid leukemia, or urethremic myelosis, or, or something like that. And it took a, 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 a while, it took several years of getting enough cases to be sure about it. Uh, but uh, what actually is happening is the lung has become mineralized so that there's a substantial ventilation perfusion mismatch between the air capillaries and the blood capillaries. And subsequently, uh, the signal to the bone marrow is hypoxia because they're not getting enough oxygen. And subsequently, a bone marrow uh, goes into production mode and is releasing a lot of erythroid uh, progenitors into the peripheral blood. And that's so you get that presentation of, of a regenerative erythroid response, even though the animal is not anemic. And this is another uh, helpful hint that there might be a problem with metastatic mineralization in these iguanas. Subsequent to that, what will happen is the owner of the lizard 
will eventually pick it up, or a child will pick it up, a little bit too rough, squeeze the salomic, uh, salomic walls together, and will rupture uh, those capillaries that are mineralized in the lung. Here's the, uh, interesting, the, the very interesting uh, proliferation of erythroid progenitors in this iguana. But what will happen after, uh, after a while is those, those mineralized vessels will rupture and there will be a perfect luminal cast of hemorrhage in the, in the central lumen uh, of the lung. It will be a perfect cast of all of the, of the, of the inner surfaces of the fabiole and they will have bled out into the lung as a result of uh, ruptured mineralized vessel. <clears throat> this is the central lumen. These are the fabiole, those, those areas of air exchange, and much hemorrhage in the central lumen and also extending into the fabiole. And a higher magnification of the interstitium and at the uh, exchange uh, location. These are blood capillaries. Uh, this is a lumen of the fabiolus. Uh, the interstitium and the walls of the capillaries are all mineralized. And you know, when one of these ruptures, then they bleed out. There are certain species of lizards and tortoises uh, that are predisposed to the development of tumoral calcinosis or pseudogown or calcinosis circumscript. Uh, Euromastix, chameleon, and several species of chelonians have, uh, have been diagnosed with this disorder. It is uh, a disorder that uh, involves the spine and the appendages and associated with deposition of hydroxyapatite crystals in the connective tissues. The pathogenesis is not understood for the development of this disorder. It differs from other deposition disorders like gout. Uh, the, uh, the, the material is intensely radio-dense, even more dense than bone. Uh, uh, and it is not on the surface of the joint uh, or in the lumen of the joint, unlike gout. It is in the connective tissues around the joint. It's in the uh, collagenous tissues and muscle around the joint rather than actually being in the joint. Uh, this is a, a normal radiograph. This is a radiograph showing uh, the deposition of this material in various joints and bones. Uh, this is a gross presentation with marked nodularity along the dorsal aspect of the, of the spinal column. And then when we peel away the skin, we see what these are. They are these irregular nodular uh, accumulations of yellow, tan, granular material that is very difficult to cut through. And this is, these are the foci of uh, uh, tumoral calcinosis. This is a turtle uh, with the same disease. Uh, note the accumulation of these nodules within the webbing of the foot. And radiographically, note the radio density involved with, uh, with, with, with these uh, lesions. Uh, we peel away the skin and the same type of pattern that we saw in the Euromastix. Uh, we also see the same disease involving the articulations or the soft tissues around the articulations uh, in chameleons, especially uh, around the stifle regions. And cytologically, you can uh, sometimes diagnose this cytologically by just uh, trying to aspirate some of it or scrape some of it. Uh, it will be uh, refractile uh, material that is, ASA, that is uh, extracellular in the, uh, uh, in the aspirate. There might be some blood as well. And histologically, just accumulations of uh, basophilic granular material consistent with mineral uh, in the connective tissues and will also be found sometimes within the fossil plants between the muscle bones.
Gallup implies uric acid deposition in tissue. And there are three forms of gout that, are, that affect reptiles. There's renal gout, visceral gout, and articular gout. Although there have been many proposed causes, dehydration, I think, is one of the major ones. And underlying chronic renal disease is another. There has been some suspicion that high-protein diets may also produce gout in reptiles and in birds. However, I think that this is beginning to fall out of uh, favor as a possible cause uh, for the development of gout. Usually, there are concurrent disease processes or prior renal lesions that have contributed to the development of gout. Or there is a history that there was a problem in the exhibit the animal couldn't get to water, or that there was antagonism in the exhibit from a, from a pen mate or a conspecific that was not allowing the animal to get to the water, the water source. Uh, and this happens with, uh, with uh, conspecifics that are mates. You know, sometimes the male during the breeding season will not allow the female to get to the water, and, uh, and subsequently the animal will become dehydrated and will uh, develop gout. An important thing about gout in reptiles is that serum uric acid levels are not particularly sensitive for the early stages of gout, and it might still be reversible. By the time that the uric acid levels are elevated substantially, those animals usually have irreversible gout in various tissues. We don't really have yet a good sensitive indicator of urate stasis and early stages of gout that might be helpful for the clinician to circumvent the more severe stages of gout. <clears throat> Grossly gout can appear similar to calcinosis circumscriptive However, a, differ, a difference is that uh, gout also occurs within the saloma cavity and on joint surfaces. Uh, these are areas where calcinosis circumscriptive does not occur in reptiles. <clears throat> these are foci uh, urea deposition occurring within the connective tissues and joints of this gecko and on the salomic surfaces here. This image it, it illustrates uh, a combination of renal and enteric lesions in a nicely prosected specimen. Uh, this is the urinary bladder of this uh, sulcotoporus with, uh, with uh, urolis present in the lumen. Uh, this, these are the kidneys, and the renal tubules are markedly distended due to urinary stasis. And uh, as a result of the uh, Urinary tract disease, this animal developed gut stasis and subsequent pseudomembranous colitis. And once they, once they get the colitis, then they become septic. Oftentimes there's a, uh, a mixed component of amoeba and bacteria in this colonic uh, Uric deposits occur in various places. These are in the oral mucous membranes of this snake. Uh, of course, these are in the kidney. Uh, of a uh, snake. Many of the, uh, these are urate deposits and then uh, with the uh, obstruction of the, of the tubules due to urate deposits there will be some uh, prominent cysts that form. Uh, this is the heart uh, in a snake that has uh, marked uh, urate deposition on the epicardial surface and then on cut surface note that there are also urates present within the myocardium of, of this animal. Histologically, uh, it has a very characteristic appearance. A uric topus is a lesion in which uric crystals have precipitated and formed 
stellate patterns of uh, sort of a, a star-like stellate pattern surrounded by a zone of macrophages uh, and, uh, and heterophils. And when these things occur in the tubules, eventually the tubule will rupture. As a result of the rupture, then there will be fibrosis and edema in the interstitium, uh, resulting in uh, enlargement of the kidney. Other foci, uh, uric deposition. Uh, this is heart, and this is uric deposition on the serosal surface of, uh, of the epicardium. When it's on the surfaces of the viscera, it usually does not form tophi like this, but instead forms a sort of fibrinous mat of, uh, of material. Uh, we, we do have one tophus beginning to develop here, but more commonly it's just a mat of fibrinous material, and that can be misconstrued as a, a an infectious process uh, if uh, you're not familiar with the deposition of urates on cirrhosal surfaces. Here we have urate deposition in the spleen, uh, forming urate tophi, uh, some uh, early urate deposition uh, causing thrombosis in the liver, uh, but still we're beginning to see that stellate pattern that's typical of urate deposition. Uh, here we have a tumbus that's in the interstitium of the lung. And in this image, we have uh, severe urate deposition occurring in the joints. And it does not necessarily form these discrete urate tophi, uh, but again, uh, more an accumulation of fibrinous material uh, that uh, uh, can be uh, disfiguring in the joint and, in, and when involving the, the articulations of the spine, will protrude up into the spinal canal and cause displacement and compression of the spinal cord. Very severe deposition disorder. Histologically, uh, I've noticed that uric crystals per se can have just about any kind of morphological appearance. Sometimes they're needle shaped, sometimes they're rhomboidal, sometimes they're hexagonal, uh, but uh, generally speaking, they are refractile and birefringent, which is helpful. Uric stasis in the kidney should not be confused with the active sexual segments that occur within the renal tubules of male reptiles. These sexual segments during active spermatogenesis can become quite prominent and they have the same type of gross appearance in the tubules that, uh, that uric stasis has. And subsequently, if, uh, if it's misidentified as gout, then the prosector may stop right there, not do any histopathology, or uh, send in just the kidney, or what have you, and then, you know, if they do that, then we don't know why it died, because we've got a normal kidney with active sexual segments, or we don't have anything to look at at all. So it's important to look at the, uh, to, to look at the whole picture, it, if it's a male, it's an active reproductive time, uh, have to consider that as a possible factor in the gross appearance of the kidney. And histologically, these, these uh, tubules have uh, hypertrophied epithelial cells that are filled with eosinophilic granules, uh, part of what's most likely uh, the accessory sex uh, secretions uh, needed for uh, copulation. Xanthomatosis implies the deposition of cholesterol in tissues, and xanthomatosis is a major problem in reptiles, especially some of the lizards. Uh, it's also a major problem in amphibians, and the deposition of this material is usually on the serosal surfaces of the saloma viscera, uh, in the corneas, and in the brain. Those animals that are affected uh, frequently will present with a head tilt uh, or uh, clouded corneas. The hypercholesterolemia is usually due to feeding high fat diets. Uh, those diets that are high in, in lipids due to gut loading the prey base. In other words, feeding a high fat diet to the crickets or mealworms that are going to then be fed to the lizard. And subsequently, the lizards continue to bioaccumulate uh, uh, cholesterol. And 
then will eventually start depositing cholesterol on, on salomic surfaces. And this invokes a severe inflammatory response. The uh, females with active follicular genesis or follicular atresia and subsequent absorption of uh, yolk material seem to be especially predisposed to developing xanthomatosis. And this is probably due to a combination of high fat diets and uh, that stage in their reproductive cycle in which they're absorbing yolk material. Pretty severe gross manifestation of xanthomatosis in the brain. What, more, what is more commonly important uh, is uh, when a clinician opens up the animal and they look at the salomic viscera, they, all they see is one big mass. And it's very difficult to sort out the various tissues because they're all coated in this uh, deposits of cholesterol and their associated inflammatory response. So it can be, you know, uh, you're not sure exactly what it is you're looking at here when you open them up, whether that's a, a particular organ or a, a combination of uh, 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 adhesions and organs. Uh, but what it really is, is uh, the deposition of cholesterol crystals and an associated inflammatory response. Cytologically, uh, there will be uh, a number of uh, histiocytes and sometimes multinucleate giant cells, and they will be associated with these uh, rhomboidal crystalline structures that are characteristic of uh, cholesterol. And that material is refractile and birefringent, which is helpful. Uh, this is a section, transverse section through the skull, and this is the brain showing severe uh, xanthomatosis involving the cerebral cortices. This is the lung showing uh, severe nodular accumulations of cholesterol and associated inflammatory response uh, in, the, uh, in the inner tissue. Uh, higher magnification of the actual tissue response. The cholesterol clefts tend, uh, the crystals tend to stack uh, like so. Uh, and, and between the stacks are macrophages. And this differs from, uh, from the histological appearance of gout, which tends to be a, a circular stellate structure rather than these stacking arrays. And this, this is, uh, sometimes can be uh, a, a little bit uh, difficult to distinguish between the two. But generally speaking, this is a typical presentation of, of xanthomatosis. The Komodo dragon has an amyloid-like presentation. Uh, there's a material that deposits in the basement membranes and interstitium of various tissues that, uh, that is uh, partially congophilic, in other words, uh, stains partially positive for amyloid with Congo red. Uh, the material histologically looks like amyloid, uh, and uh, uh, it is associated with uh, substantial disease. In, in the Komodo dragon, especially in the females. Uh, there is uh, uh, generally amyloid deposition is, is uncommon to rare in reptiles. There, is, there are some, there are some uh, exceptions. The, the colubrid snake sometimes will have, have a little bit of amyloid in the sinusoids of the liver as they age, uh, but not associated with disease. Whereas this this disorder in the Komodo dragon is, uh, is, is a considerable problem. Grossly, uh, this is kidney, uh, and these, these coalescent zones of white discoloration, this is a form of fixed specimen, but these zones of white discoloration here represent the deposits. Uh, this is a histologic section corresponding with the gross lesion, and this, this uh, dark blue material that extends into the mesangium of the glomerulus and down into the interstitium and wraps around the basement membranes of the tubules uh, is this uh, deposition of amyloid-like material. It has a propensity for getting into the vessel walls like so, in a way that amyloid frequently does in mammals. Uh, this is a Congo red stain uh, showing the partial congophilic nature of the material. 
This is a ovary. This is the follicle, uh, or rather the, uh, the follicular lumen containing um, uh, yolk material. And this is a vessel wall out in the uh, capsule of the follicle. What happens with these animals is the vessel wall eventually ruptures. And when that happens, then yolk material gets into the vessel wall and it embolizes to the lung. These are lung, uh, this is the lung section showing uh, numerous yolk emboli and the capillaries. Uh, and this is uh, immediately fatal. So, you can have a, a female promoter dragon, previously normal, and in active stages of reproductive behavior, interacting with the male, etc., and then all of a sudden found dead. And what has happened is uh, there's been traumatic rupture of these uh, compromised vessel walls and subsequent yoga embolization. Colon is common in herbivorous lizards, uh, bearded dragon, iguana. Uh, it can be an incidental or it can be obstructive. And uh, obstructive processes uh, have been uh, uh, particularly problematic uh, in the iguanas. Subsequently, there's biliary hyperplasia, fibrosis, cirrhosis, and, and cause for the development of colitis is not really understood. It is important when a necropsy is performed that, especially in those li livers that look like they're cirrhotic or going to have some kind of pathologic change, that the common bile duct is very carefully examined because I think we miss a lot of lesions when we ignore it. Coliliths, possibly ascending parasites, even tumors could possibly be missed if we're not looking at that common bile duct uh, all the way down to its junction with the guadal. Because this one was filled with stones. In the green iguana, with coliolithiasis or other obstructive processes of the biliary tree, uh, we will see marked hepatic enlargement. And that enlargement is due to hyperplasia of the bile ducts. And it's a diffuse process. It's so diffuse and so all, uh, 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 all effacing or encompassing of the parenchyma, it actually looks like tumor, although it's well differentiated bile ducts. And it's just a fluid hyperplastic process associated with obstruction of those ducts. In most cases, due to colon lithiasis. <laughs> and then there are a, normal, a, a number of normal pigments that also occur in, in uh, reptiles. <laughs> There's uh, lipofuscin. Uh, which is an aging pigment that occurs in the renal tubules uh, and uh, within uh, the melanohypophos centers. Iron deposition is often seen in hepatocytes and generally is well tolerated. Uh, melanin and melanin-like pigments are seen frequently on cirrhosal surfaces of the viscera uh, on, on, uh, uh, and in the liver. Sometimes when you open up a uh, lizard, uh, all you see is a, a black sheet uh, covering the salomic viscera, and that's normal. Many uh, very pretty colorful pigments in the reptile tissues. In the liver, the lizards and chelonians have melanohypophos centers, and these are large aggregates of macrophages that contain these pigments. And with aging, free radical detoxification, uh, chronic inflammation or wasting, these melanohypophos centers can get quite prominent and uh, can actually be seen grossly uh, to some extent. But they actually, in and of themselves, are not associated with disease. And unfortunately, sometimes they are mistaken for metastatic foci of melanoma, uh, but they are actually normal structures. 
Well, that's what the mammal said we talked about uh, earlier. We see a lot of nutritional disease in the reptiles. A combination of things. Obesity, emaciation, they're the most common. Uh, nutritional and metabolic bone disease. A bad equipidosis. And uh, in some cases, hypovitaminosis C, although the latter is usually associated with just the carnivorous lizards and snakes. <clears throat> Obesity is, is uh, common in the large sedentary uh, <coughs> reptiles, uh, uh, carnivorous reptiles, uh, particularly the monitor lizards uh, and uh, snapping turtles, uh, these kinds of uh, reptiles. The important thing is it may be associated with pathophidosis. In Chelonians, pathophidosis is well tolerated. They can tolerate an enormous amount of lipid in their liver, or at least it appears they can, because it's a very common problem. A pathophidosis is not well tolerated in snakes or in, in lizards. And, and this should uh, try to avoid the development of a pathophidosis in those animals by uh, avoiding obesity. This big, you know, python is, uh, is really fat. It's a fat snake. And these individual fat bodies here are all uh, very prominent uh, in this, this sedentary python. Uh, this, this bearded dragon also uh, has a, a rotund coelom, and that's due to very prominent fat, uh, fat bodies. And uh, note that it also has hepatic lipidosis. Uh, that's not a good thing to have if you're a lizard. Now, emaciation is generally due to uh, suboptimal nutrition, but that may be due to the animal's reluctance to eat because it is in a uh, suboptimal environment or because there is uh, conspecific aggression, poor exhibit design, and the animal can't get to the food. Uh, or uh, perhaps there is underlying disease. That's, uh, that is a very common cause for, for emaciation in reptiles. So in this uh, basilisk, I, I don't think it's difficult to uh, appreciate uh, that it is one very skinny lizard. More difficult to determine whether or not a Chelonian is emaciated. But they, they um, oftentimes will have uh, a withdrawn appearance. The, the skin in the axillary and uh, uh, inguinal areas will be withdrawn inside the shell. Uh, their, uh, their eyes will be sunken. Uh, but uh, aside from that, it can be difficult to determine if they're really emaciated. Snakes. Uh, also can be a little difficult to determine if they're uh, really emaciated. You have to be familiar with the normal appearance of a well-nourished snake of that species. This happens to be an indigo snake. And indigo snakes are generally robust snakes that are, uh, that are uh, fairly rotund normally. And uh, this one's very skinny. This was one that was uh, became septic following the uh, implant into the Saloma cavity for tracking purposes. So uh, back to that, uh, that old beast python here. We, we have uh, fat bodies here that are just very substantial, quite prominent. Correlating with that, we have uh, a snake that has uh, emaciation. And these pink structures here are the fat bodies. And the reason why they're pink instead of white is because although the lipid cells are still there, they no longer have any lipid in them. So they have shrunken up. And this brings the capillaries adjacent to the lipid cells closer together. So now that the capillaries are closer together, and they still have blood flowing through them, they look pink. And that's what we have here is a bunch of pink fat bodies. Pink fat bodies are bad uh, in the snake because it means they're emaciated. And not only was this one emaciated, but it was hypoproteinemic and subsequently had a salomic effusion uh, related to the hypoproteinemia. Other fat depots in reptiles uh, exist. 
this is a uh, alligator snapping turtle, and this is uh, this is a perirenal fat, uh, and uh, this uh, fat body here has Mark Sears after. Histologically, and this is important for us histopathologists, uh, it's important to recognize uh, what an atrophic fat body looks like in a snake because it could be mistaken for something else. Uh, but uh, these are all fat bodies uh, in the mesentery of a snake. And the reason why they're pink is because although the fat cells are all still present, they have no lipid, and that brings these capillaries closer together and makes the gross appearance of that body pink. This is liver in an emaciated snake. Uh, note that the hepatic cords are atrophy and the space between the hepatic cords is expanded. That's because these sinusoids are expanded because the hepatocytes are atrophic, but also because there is now edema uh, developing uh, in the uh, adjacent parenchyma. So we have a combination of distension due to atrophy of the hepatic cords and accumulation of, of edema due to hypogropenemia. We also see atrophy of the uh, acinar cells in the pancreas, uh, and that manifests as depletion of zymogen granules in the acinar cells and subsequent uh, uh, shrinkage of the, of the acinar tissue. These are the acinar cells, and generally they would have uh, a large number of zymogen granules within the cytoplasm, uh, but these have none. Uh, Paddock lipidosis is common in reptiles. Uh, there, because of uh, various factors, either obesity, inanition, uh, malnutrition, endocrine metabolic arrangements, preparation for or emerging from rumination, or active reproductive status. Because females can develop hepatic lipidosis to a certain extent associated with active reproductive status, and because storage of lipid can occur in preparation for or emerging from rumination, the finding of hepatic lipidosis has to be interpreted conservatively, especially in biopsy specimens. It's always good to have a history of, of the uh, status of that animal at the time the biopsy was obtained. This is a bearded dragon. Uh, with uh, uh, severe hepatic lipidosis and uh, corpulent fat bodies uh, and the histologic appearance of the hepatic lipidosis in this case, uh, quite severe hepatocytes are distended with uh, lipid. Now, this is a radiated tortoise that also has severe hepatic lipidosis, but in tortoises, this kind of uh, hepatic lipidosis is generally well tolerated and may not even be associated with disease. We're not absolutely sure about that, but uh, generally speaking, uh, hepatic lipidosis seems to be well tolerated in the chelonians, especially the tortoises. Uh, metabolic or nutritional bone disease, if you will, is very common in uh, reptiles especially herbivorous reptiles, uh, and in the lizards, it's associated with fibrous osteodystrophy. This includes fractures of the vertebrae uh, with uh, subsequent impingement on the spinal cord and posterior paresis or paralysis, uh, thin bone cortices, pathologic fractures in the long bones, uh, swelling of the, uh, of the jaw due to fibrous metaplasia, associated with uh, bone resorption in the dental arcades. Um, and this is a typical appearance in iguana. Note the swelling of the, of, the, uh, of the dental arcade regions here due to fibrous metaplasia. Also note the marked swelling of the limbs. Here this is all fibrous metaplasia in an attempt to compensate for bone loss in the long bones. Radiographic appearance. Uh, note the uh, loss of density in the long bones, and this is uh, compensated for by this uh, uh, increase in dense fibrous connective tissue in an attempt to stabilize the limb uh, for weight-bearing purposes. 
there's marked reduction in bone density here in the tail. And then sometimes what you'll see grossly, in addition to very thin ribs, is you'll see uh, pathologic fractures that have occurred uh, mostly at the costal junctions of the ribs. And this is probably just from either breathing or from being picked up by the, by the keeper or owner and uh, being held and accidentally too, held too tightly and these, these, these uh, compromised bones and fracture. This is a histologic section in longitudinal plane of the vertebral column of an animal with uh, metabolic bone disease. Uh, bone density is markedly compromised in the vertebral bodies, and there is a pathologic fracture that occurred here in the metaphyseal region of this long bone that resulted in uh, luxation. Of the, uh, of the articulation up into the vertebral canal and associated compression of the spinal cord. Now, that said, in Chelonians, metabolic bone disease manifests in a different manner. It is not associated with fibrous metaplasia, just osteopenia. There's less bone, but no fibrous metaplasia reactive response associated with the osteopenia. So, in a Chelonian, the carapace in this case has become concave due to loss of bone. When you flip that carapace over, you can see right through the bone plates of the carapace to the underside of the scoop. No fibrous metaplasia at all, just complete bone loss. You can even count the ribs. You should never be able to see the ribs uh, in a healthy carapace. Does everybody understand what I mean between the two different the differences between uh, <clears throat> fibrous metaplasia in the uh, lizards and in the chelonians? The clinical presentation is different. Necrotizing stomatitis associated with hypovitaminosis A, uh, E rather, is um, uncommon and limited primarily to the carnivorous lizards and snakes. These animals tend to be obese and the likely uh, causes are rancid, rancid diet of rats, you know, rancid rats and rancid fish uh, and uh, possibly uh, stress-related lesions as well. Because we uh, sometimes will see concurrent myocardial and skeletal muscle necrosis and mineralization in these lesions. These are the fat bodies in an obese monitor lizard. And uh, they're in pretty bad shape. Uh, these areas of discoloration throughout the fat bodies are associated with central necrosis of the fat body. Uh, when you uh, make an incision through the fat body, you can see all of the necrotic tissue on the inside. Uh, off this course, and this is the early stages of the fat necrosis in one of the fat bodies where we have some red discoloration. This corresponds to the early stages of the necrosis. Uh, a little bit higher magnification of the necrotic center of the fat body. So we'll talk about the prevalence of neoplasia now uh, in reptiles. Old literature used to say that it was uncommon to see neoplasia in reptiles. But we now know in the last 30, 40 years that that's not true at all. It probably was just that we didn't look at very many reptiles. Uh, but uh, now uh, reptile pathology has advanced considerably and uh, Neoplasia is obviously more common than one's thought. So we, uh, we looked at our archives uh, of neoplasia in reptiles, kind of like I did with the cats this morning. And uh, we found that the prevalence of reptiles is uh, higher, highest in the snakes and then lizards. 
and then the Chelonians, and then the Crocodilians. The Chelonians and Crocodilians really have a low prevalence of neoplasia. Snakes and lizards, not so much so. So, um, the overall prevalence in our study, we have 10% uh, neoplasia in our reptile uh, archives up to 2010. And we can see the distribution of neoplasia here with <coughs> snakes uh, considerably higher than the others. And within the snakes, the colubrids uh, are especially from, that's the, you know, the rat snakes, the king snakes, etc., garter snakes. And then the crotalids, and then the vipers, and then the boids. In the lizards, uh, the monitor lizards, the carnivores, more frequently uh, had neoplastic processes than did uh, the uh, agamid lizards or the geckos. Uh, and in the chelonians, well, <coughs> turtles and terrapins, uh, more so than the tortoises, <coughs> but really low prevalence in, in general for the chelonians. The snakes have the uh, highest prevalence of sarcoma and lymphoma and then renal adenocarcinomas. Uh, there were uh, several other types of uh, neoplasia. In the lizards, again, also sarcomas and lymphoma and then squamous cell carcinomas. Uh, individual tumors to discuss are uh, the renal adenocarcinomas. These are particularly common in snakes, especially colubrids. Uh, they can be solitary, unilateral, or bilateral, and can also be multicentric within the same kidney. They typically are tubular capillary and thus can be cystic. And an interesting feature about these tumors is their propensity for developing urates and very tophi within the neoplastic population. Fortunately, renal tubular adenocarcinomas in most cases are slow to metastasize. They can achieve large size, large enough to see grossly as a mass in the coliseum. And, and, uh, and it is one of these neoplastic processes that is a potential surgical candidate for the clinicians. This is a typical presentation. This is a, a California king snake uh, with a colosolomic mass, and this mass was surgically excised. It no longer really resembles a snake kidney at this stage, but on the inner end, the inner and outer surfaces, many coalescing granular deposits. These correspond to the to the uh, uric tophi that the tumor forms. <laughs> and histologically, they uh, tend to form tubular papillary or cystic formations. This is normal kidney over here. This is the tumor. Uh, a little bit higher magnification over here. Uh, the neoplastic cells are tubular, ductular, and sometimes papillary. Uh, they can be associated with a steerous response in the surrounding tissues as they invade. And these are the uric tophi that develop within the neoplastic tubules. It is not done to see multicentric benign renal tubular neoplasia, uh, as in this corn snake had uh, multiple uh, tubular adenomas, but also with uric deposition. The question is whether or not these lesions have potential for future transformation to adenocarcinoma. And if there is actually a continuum in the development of hyperplasia, adenoma, and adenocarcinoma. And I don't think we know that information. Snakes are not the only ones that get renal tubular tumors. Uh, this is an anole with an adenocarcinoma in the kidney. And uh, you can imagine uh, how uh, obstructive that could be as that tumor enlarges. Uh, 
uh, kidneys and the, the snake uh, and the lizards are uh, in the uh, pelvic canal, and there's not much room there for expansion. So there's going to be a, uh, some obstruction associated with this tumor eventually. And in contrast to snakes, uh, these tumors in lizards uh, are going to be problematic regarding the surgical decision. Proliferative lesions of hepatocytes in reptiles are very common, especially in the snakes. Uh, and there uh, does appear to be a continuum in the development of nodular hyperplasia, uh, hepatocellular adenoma, or what is sometimes termed hepatoma, and hepatocellular carcinoma. They are, they're also, uh, we also see biliary tumors in these reptiles, uh, especially in the lizards. Uh, and we sometimes will see primary vascular neoplasms in the liver of the guanos. But the big, the, the, the big ones are the hepatocellular lesions that occur uh, primarily in snakes. These are very common. Uh, the hepatocellular carcinomas can be solitary or multicentric. Generally, they're very well differentiated neoplasms. Uh, they do not invoke a skewish response, and they only rarely metastasize. Hepatocellular adenomas are particularly common in the uh, colubrid snakes. Uh, they can be solitary or multicentric and generally are very well differentiated. Uh, there, there are a number of these tumors in this particular image uh, of the liver. Uh, we do see some pancreatic neoplasia in, uh, in reptiles. Uh, primarily exocrine tumors, although recently uh, we did publish on uh, island cell tumors in the Komodo dragon. Uh, the, the exocrine tumors can be benign or malignant. The benign tumors are generally well encapsulated and can be confused with hyperplasia in a smaller lesion. And the benign neoplasms generally, like I say, are encapsulated tumors that are well defined and separated from the adjacent uh, pancreatic parenchyma. Uh, it's a higher magnification of these extra pancreatic adenomas uh, butting, butting up against the capsule, and this is the adjacent uh, pancreatic parenchyma. In contrast, pancreatic adenocarcinomas, which are common in snakes and uh, somewhat rare in lizards, uh, also are generally well differentiated and have the typical acinar pattern. However, they are aggressive malignancies. Uh, invoke a scarce response, uh, readily metastasize, can be associated with carcinomatosis as well. Very aggressive malignancy. Uh, this is a king snake with a mid-body swelling, uh, and this corresponds to a pancreatic tumor, pancreatic adenocarcinoma, which has adhered itself to the serosal surface of the intestine in this animal. And these tumors can be very well differentiated. These are, this is the acinar presentation of this tumor. Uh, there's considerable anaplasia in the cells. However, uh, it is still differentiated enough that we can tell it's of acinar origin. And in fact, even uh, some of the cells even have zymogen granules. Uh, but the tumor is invasive here. It's invading uh, into the mesentery and associated with a substantial skewish response. A little bit higher magnification of this tumor and it's associated with serious response. Intestinal adenocarcinoma, uh, again common in the colubrid snakes, uh, generally involves the distal small intestine and colon, and primarily these are invasive neoplasms. They have typical glandular patterns and glandular nests, uh, and also invoke a serious response. They can be associated with intussusception, or prolapse of the uh, cloaca and colon. Uh, and occasionally we'll see some metastasis of these tumors, but they're primarily invasive. And, uh, and uh, the presentation usually will be uh, death due to an intussusception, or there will be persistent or, or, uh, uh, or recurrent prolapses of the cloaca that necessitate nutrient aging. There's a nice intussusception associated with an intestinal adenocarcinoma. 
Uh, this is what the tumor looks like on cut surface, uh, ulcerated on its mucosal surface, uh, and uh, uh, proliferative response here in the, in, uh, in the wall that is mostly scarce tissue. These are metastatic foci of the tumor within the liver of this particular snake. And histologically, they look like uh, the intestinal animal carcinomas that occur in other species of animals, including mammals. The uh, tumor arises from the mucosa, extends down into the uh, submucosa, and then into the muscular tunics. And uh, while doing so, is, a, is invoking a scarce response, a fibrous response uh, by the body in an attempt to slow it down. And this is uh, what the neoplastic population looks like. Uh, sometimes forms glands, uh, but more often than not, just forms nests or individual cells uh, in the steer stone. Gastric adenocarcinomas are primarily the disease of old snakes and are especially uh, uh, seen in boa snakes, like uh, boas and pythons. Uh, and of course, in that location, uh, their clinical signs can be confused with other gastric diseases, like cryptosporidiosis, uh, ulceration associated with adenovirus infections or reflux, um, the, uh, mineralization of the gastric mucosa. Uh, so uh, eventually, uh, clinicians will identify the tumor in there after they've uh, exhausted the other techniques for their other disease processes. But you really need a biopsy. Uh, gavage, uh, samples of the stomach, and aspirate cytology generally are, are not sensitive enough to uh, make a diagnosis of this tumor. <clears throat> Ovarian adenocarcinomas are uh, primarily seen in iguanas, sometimes in colubrid snakes and boids, uh, and they are uh, sometimes tubular papillary, but I, I, I will note that they oftentimes are not well differentiated. They, they are associated with metastasis and carcinomatosis, and because of the latter, uh, frequently associated with many adhesions throughout the saloma cavity, and we don't always get the primary tumor. We just get masses that were, that were selected by the clinician at necropsy, and in those poorly differentiated neoplasms, uh, it can be difficult to determine uh, what the cell of origin actually was if you're not familiar with these tumors and the uh, propensity for their development in certain animals. This is a mid-body to call a third swelling uh, in a uh, diamond python associated with uh, uh, an ovarian adenocarcinoma. This is prosected adenocarcinoma in the ovary. Uh, it has a typical tubular papillary appearance here, uh, but uh, also in, in other portions of the tumor, it's becoming less differentiated. And, and in this area here, uh, almost impossible to determine that that's an ovarian tumor. And unfortunately, uh, they will readily metastasize. This is an embolus of the tumor uh, within a vascular channel in the heart. The squamous cell tumors are squamous cell carcinomas, uh, primarily the oral tumors in the lizards and snakes, uh, and then can uh, rarely be seen in the chelonians in the oral cavity. Uh, cutaneous in lizards and turtles, and can be multicentric in the uh, chameleon. And uh, pathogenesis of the multicentric lesions isn't understood. We've looked at several different possibilities, that, but have been unsuccessful in determining the underlying cause. Uh, transformation of the scent gland in squamous cell carcinoma is common in snakes. And uh, especially in the older, large breeds of snakes. This can be confused with scent gland adenitis, uh, which is something that clinicians tend to treat and uh, get frustrated with the lack of response or partial response and then recurrence of the lesion. And eventually will biopsy and find that it actually was an underlying squamous cell carcinoma. Fortunately, squamous cell carcinomas in reptiles are. Uh, invasive but slow to metastasize. This is a squamous cell carcinoma uh, in painted turtle, uh, showing a severe uh, proliferative uh, presentation in the mouth, uh, 
mouth, it can't even close the mouth anymore, uh, probably involving the tongue. Uh, this is the multicentric distribution of squamous cell carcinomas in, uh, in a chameleon. We uh, tried electron microscopy, PCR, immunohistochemistry, looking for the oncogenic viruses that sometimes can cause squamous cell carcinomas in papilloma doses. And boy, we, we just did not find anything. And, uh, there is some concern that because of the distribution of these things, which is primarily lateral, or rather dorsal and dorsal lateral, that it could be that these are induced by solar irritation or thermal irritation. This is a presentation of uh, scent gland adenocarcinoma, marked swelling in the region of the cloaca. Uh, these are not pretty neoplasms, and, uh, and usually secondarily infected with bacteria or fungi. This is normal scent gland, <coughs> normal scent gland wall, and normal scent gland secretory material, and uh, a little bit higher magnification, normal scent gland. This is uh, squamous cell carcinoma scent gland. Uh, the secretory material has now become inspissated, uh, and the wall has become thickened due to hyperplasia, dysplasia, and neoplastic transformation to squamous cell carcinoma. And the tumor then extends into the wall of the uh, surrounding connective tissue and invokes a skewer's response. The wall is compromised due to the tumor, and they get secondary bacterial and clot infections that contribute to the surrounding cellulitis. It's a, a real ugly lesion. Bearded dragons have a predisposition for development of squamous cell carcinomas. Uh, adjacent to the eye or between the eye and the ear. And otherwise, their distribution of squamous cell carcinoma is, uh, well, it's not seen elsewhere. It's very rare to see a squamous cell carcinoma anywhere except in these locations in the bearded dragons. Uh, they can invade the orbit, uh, which is problematic, uh, and they can be difficult to completely excise because there's, there's not a great deal of room up here to, uh, to get these tumors off. This one here is right on the eyelid, uh, and uh, they're, they're slow to metastasize, though, and so uh, debulking surgeries or cauterization are sometimes helpful. And again, the cause for the development of these tumors in these locations in the bearded dragon is not understood. Why it has that propensity for development in, the, in that specific location. Tear gland or Hardarian gland tumors are a, a tumor that is seen in lizards, uh, predominantly iguanas and chameleons, although occasionally we see them in skinks. Uh, they can be unilateral or bilateral, and depending on their location and size, can be associated with lufalmia. Uh, and uh, they do, the malignant variants will invade the surrounding soft tissues. Uh, I don't know about metastasis. I have not seen metastasis, uh, but uh, but the local tissue invasion into the surrounding soft tissues and, and uh, sinuses can be problematic, as well as the blue family, but sometimes will require, uh, require uh, enucleation of the eye. This is a, this is a skin uh, with uh, blue family and uh, an ulceration of the cornea, and that's because uh, after they nucleated the eye, they didn't know what was going on here until they nucleated the eye. And here's a tumor behind it. A, tear, a hard area or tear gland tumor. Now, melanomas are relatively common in reptiles, especially in snakes. And uh, these data are now in publication uh, and they're easily documented, uh, easily ac ac accessioned. Uh, San Francisco garter snake may be somewhat predisposed, but frankly, it is such a common tumor in snakes that uh, there are probably several uh, species that may be predisposed. These tumors are invasive, difficult to complete the excise, and can metastasize. Uh, there are both epithelioid and spindle cell variants, and uh, differentiation of the tumors and cellular anaplasia are highly variable. And in my humble opinion, uh, 
I do not think that the cell morphology of these tumors is an adequate predictor of how it's going to behave. In other words, uh, well differentiated tumors uh, with little cellular anaplasia can metastasize to the viscera, and then uh, these tumors with a high degree of cellular anaplasia and almost no differentiation uh, remain localized and invasive, but uh, no metastasis. So I, I have troubles correlating the morphologic features of the cells with uh, the biological behavior. I think it's important to realize, though, that they're they are melanomas, or chromatophoromas, or however you want to classify the pigment of tumors and reptiles. But because of that, they should always be considered potentially uh, malignant with the capability of metastasis. This is a San Francisco garter snake with a melanoma in the skin. And this thing has gone right through its connective tissues and right into the dorsal spinous processes of the vertebrae. This is a, a, a melanoma, or a chromatophoroma, if you will, that, that lacks that dark pigment. It probably is a, a, what would we call a xanthochromatophoroma or a iridochromatophoroma. Uh, in other words, uh, red pigment or yellow pigment uh, rather than, than black pigment. This is a bearded dragon that has a, a multicentric cutaneous distribution of melanoma. Unclear if this is a, a these tumors are unrelated or if uh, one or more represent metastatic lesions. And in this mass of Sonda, which is a rattlesnake, uh, this, this uh, snake had a history of, uh, of a xanthochromatophoroma in the skin that we were following for a couple of years. They take it out, come back, we take it out, come back, uh, and then they finally put it down. And sure enough, uh, this is, uh, these are all metastatic parasites within the liver and on the mesenteric surfaces. Now, re relatively well differentiated tumor, too. Uh, so uh, I don't think they were expecting this, but uh, a learning uh, process for all of us. So this is the skin. Uh, this is the epidermis. This is the dermis. The dermis is expanded by what we would consider a well differentiated melanoma. Uh, heavily pigmented tumor, so pigmented that it's difficult to identify and classify the nuclei. Uh, and then this is a poorly differentiated melanoma in which there's almost no pigment present in the cells, and there's more cellular anaplasia and mesoperiosis occasional mitosis. <clears throat> this is a metastatic uh, melanoma, poorly differentiated anaplastic high-grade malignancy in the kidney and in the liver. This is a metastatic melanoma, very well differentiated, still producing lots of pigment in the liver and in the lung. So, like I say, when, uh, when we see these skin tumors, these melanomas or pigmented tumors in the skin, we have to be cautious about their biological behavior and assume that all of them have potential for metastasis. The bearded dragon is the boxer dog of the reptile community when it comes to tumors. And uh, in this particular case of gastric endocrine carcinoma, this is a good example of the bearded dragon. Uh, because uh, gastric endocrine carcinomas are rare in all species within the animal kingdom. But the bearded dragon is predisposed to the development of these tumors. And uh, we have all ages, nine months old is the, is the youngest one that we have on file. I suspect that there's some kind of genetic predisposition to the development of this neoplasm of the bearded dragon. Uh, the, the animals will present not doing well, thin. They oftentimes will have profound hyperglycemia, sometimes tenfold higher than normal uh, glucose values. Uh, the tumor arises in the andral or pyloric region of the stomach, uh, and generally they are well differentiated, but uh, with considerable cellular anaplasia. These tumors readily metastasize. By the time that they're identified, it's way too late. They can be diagnosed by biopsy, but oftentimes are identified only in necropsy. We have had a couple in which uh, the biopsy, uh, the diagnosis was made from an aspirate of the skin mass. 
so it will metastasize to skin, and this is the earliest uh, of, uh, you know, appearance of the tumor to the clinician. Now I might be dealing with uh, uh, inanition, uh, just not doing well, and, uh, and then uh, a week later it comes in with a mass on the skin, and they aspirate it, and it's, a, it's an endocrine tumor. Now, uh, why the hyperglycemia? Well, uh, of course, we were thinking that because it's an endocrine tumor and it's associated with hyperglycemia, that it must be uh, a glucagon-producing uh, tumor. In other words, a tumor of uh, alpha cell origin. But it turns out that, provided that our immunohistochemical markers were correct, that these are somatostatin nomas of delta cell origin. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, the somatostatin nomas in humans are associated with hyperglycemia as well. Uh, so it fit. And uh, so we think these are somatostatin nomas. Now, what the clinician does, if they're not familiar with these tumors, they open up this skinny bearded dragon and they see all of these masses in the liver, and they stop right there because they think they've got a liver tumor. And they take out a piece of the liver, and that's it. They send it in. You know, and of course, all we've got is an endocrine carcinoma in the liver when we get the biopsy. But if we're familiar with the disease, we know what happened, that they didn't look close enough at the stomach. Uh, but for those pathologists that are not familiar with, uh, with Beard and Dragon, uh, uh, trick pathology, if you will, uh, they may be inclined to think that there was a primary endocrine tumor in the liver, or that there was a, uh, a tumor in a primary endocrine organ that metastasized to the liver. But uh, the fact of the matter is, these tumors readily metastasize just about everywhere, especially though in the liver and the kidney. And when the clinicians see this, they should go right to the stomach and see if there's anything else going on. Because uh, once the uh, pluck is removed, or you, uh, or you uh, identify the alimentary tract, here's the tumor that's developing here in the uh, antral region of the stomach. Uh, and on cut surface, it's an ulcerated, raised mass. Uh, been around uh, for a while. Uh, it, uh, this is a histologic appearance. This is the mucosa. This is the muscular tunic. This is the submucosa. Uh, which is markedly expanded by development of this tumor. And then the tumor is starting to go down through the muscular tunics here, and uh, it's going to get into the lymphatic channel. See, here it's already in the lymphatic channel, and, and this is a metastatic focus of the tumor uh, in the kidney. And this is a metastatic focus of the tumor in the liver. Note that he also has some lymphatic lipidosis. And although these tumors are well differentiated, we, we readily recognize it as endocrine origin because of its pattern. Uh, they have a high degree of cellular anaplasia. Uh, uh, Mark the nasal karyosis, even karyogalic change, or sometimes it'll be binding to the eating cells. Pretty high mitotic index in these tumors, depending on where you look at it. Uh, and, uh, and then their biological behavior corresponds well with their degree of cellular anaplasia. High grade malignancy. Fibrosarcoma and other spindle cell sarcomas uh, are fairly frequent. In fact, some of the most frequent tumors that we encounter uh, in the snakes and lizards. Uh, and <clears throat> primarily in the body wall and oral cavity. Uh, these are invasive tumors, they're slow to metastasize. Uh, their morphology is similar to what we see in mammals with spindle cell sarcomas. Uh, the cellular anaplasia can be variable. And I think sometimes we confuse these anaplastic variants with uh, anaplastic melanomas in the body wall. Uh, they're hard to differentiate, I think. The, the, more, uh, the more bland tumors oftentimes are associated with collagen production, though, and are uh, less aggressive. Here we, we, here we have a, sort of a, a spectrum in the development of different types of uh, spindle cell tumors in snakes. Uh, somewhat low grade malignancy here, uh, inter intermediate grade, and we've got one here with a uh, uh, substantial degree of cellular anaplasia.
there's something about geckos and rhabdomyosarcomas. Now, rhabdomyosarcomas are uncommon tumors. This is a tumor of skeletal muscle origin. And, and these are uncommon tumors in, in any species. However, geckos, for some reason or another, develop intrasalomic rhabdomyosarcomas. We don't know where the tissue of origin is. By the time we get them, they're, they're distributed throughout the salomic cavity. Uh, they can be very poorly differentiated, or they can be well differentiated, uh, even to the point that they're still forming cross striations within the sarcoplast. Interestingly enough, uh, many of these cases are associated with concurrent intrasalomic xanthomatosis. So the question is whether or not uh, the xanthomatosis is irritating uh, salomic surfaces of the body wall to the extent that uh, skeletal muscle fibers are transforming to uh, xanthom uh, to a rhabdomyosarcoma. It's an interesting association. Uh, I have to interpret it conservatively because geckos are also prone to developing xanthomatosis anyway. And it could just be coincidental. Uh, but because they're prone to developing xanthomatosis and because rhabdomyosarcomas are otherwise rare neoplasms, it's tempting you know, to speculate that the two are connected somehow. And these tumors, uh, I can say, uh, another form of spindle cell tumor, uh, but uh, they can be pretty well differentiated, and we can actually see cross striations in the sarcoplasm of those, uh, of those uh, neoplastic cells using a PTAH stain, which uh, stains those uh, mild, fiber, uh, uh, mild fibers in the sarcoplasm of the, of the cell. Now, soft tissue sarcomas probably include fibrosarcomas and include uh, anaplastic uh, and poorly differentiated uh, melanoma, uh, but they are common in snakes. Primarily involve the skin and viscera, and you can pick them up on cytology. You know, it's a it's a spindle cell neoplasm. Uh, we'll have varying degrees of uh, cellular activity, uh, but by the time that we get them, it's very difficult to determine the primary site or the cell of origin. Some of them can have a very high degree of cellular anaplasia, and these tumors are miserably invasive and will frequently metastasize. The snakes will present with a mass in the body wall like so. Uh, they will, uh, uh, this is a biopsy site here, and it's healed, uh, but uh, eventually this, this tumor has invaded into the, into the underlying muscle, uh, probably also in the vertebral column by now. Uh, also what we'll see with these tumors sometimes is uh, they will invade the lymphatic channels and will metastasize downstream to another portion of the skin, so they'll present with multiple nodules in the skin, like so. And again, uh, they can vary from uh, somewhat low grade to slightly higher grade, all the way up to fairly anaplastic tumors. And sometimes pathologists will write these out as undifferentiated high grade sarcomas, histiocytic sarcomas, uh, uh, neurofibro sarcomas. I don't know that any of that is important other than to understand the fact that they occur in snakes and are very invasive and, and bad to have. We occasionally will see uh, vascular neoplasms. This is a rattlesnake with a hemangiosarcoma occurring uh, uh, on the head. Um, we see both benign hemolytic vascular neoplasms, not only in the skin, but also in the salonic cavity, uh, primarily in snakes, although there is a form of hemangiosarcoma that seems to be uh, somewhat frequently seen in the liver of the guanics. Now, in this location, this lesion in a rattlesnake could be anything. I mean, it could be trauma, uh, it could be a bite wound, uh, in, in other words, an envenomation type site from another rattlesnake. Uh, or uh, other predator, uh, and it, it, it will take a while for you to get to the diagnosis of the manual sarcoma after you've exhausted all the other possibilities and finally biopsy it. Uh, Cytologic diagnosis is often not helpful because uh, usually all you get is uh, aspirated blood. Need a biopsy. Congress sarcomas are uh, 
diseases of colubrid snakes primarily, also occasionally seen in pro uh, protolids, and they arise from the vertebral facets. So they're going to be a mass that involves the vertebral column. Usually they're solitary, they're locally invasive, uh, they associate with pathologic fractures, and uh, subsequently paralysis distal to the fracture site. Generally, they are very well differentiated neoplasms. Uh, they form uh, uh, you know, tumor cells within lacunae, uh, those uh, clear spaces that uh, chondrocytes develop in, and then there will also be a well-established chondromous uh, matrix in these tumors. They are not a particularly challenging uh, histologic diagnosis. I have had a couple in which, you know, it's clearly a chondrosarcoma, and the, but there were a few areas within the tumor where it had become uh, poorly differentiated. This is a typical presentation. A single solitary mass in, in the vertebral canal. That's important because snakes can also present a multicentric masses throughout the vertebral canal that are a totally different disease that we'll talk about later this afternoon. But the solitary appearance like this is never a good thing in the vertebral canal because uh, it could indicate that there's a tumor there or a granuloma and uh, subsequently, uh, you know, uh, invasion of the vertebral column. But these tumors generally are well differentiated tumors. Um, they, they will occasionally have uh, two nuclei within the lacunae. Uh, sometimes there will be a mitotic figure present. Uh, that's enough, cri enough criteria to establish uh, malignancy, but really their biological behavior helps to establish a malignant characteristic because they're very invasive. Uh, they destroy bone and uh, will be associated with pathologic fracture. This is also a chondrosarcoma, but with more cellular amplasia than what we see here, less differentiation. Nerve sheet tumors are well documented in bearded dragons involving the limbs and trunk. They have low grade cell morphology and unfortunately a slow rate of metastasis uh, to other portions of the skin and into the viscera. And these tumors have the typical morphology of a nerve sheet tumor, short stacking palisades, uh, spindle cells and collagenous or degenerative stroma, and with a little cellular anaplasia in most cases, they typically are a solid tumor that sometimes have some necrosis associated with loss of uh, blood supply. And of course, they're in, in a leg like this, so a big swelling, uh, big swollen mass effect. Hematopoietic tumors, are the most commonly reported tumors in rats. Primarily lymphoma. Sometimes lymphocytic or lymphoblastic leukemia. Uh, and uh, as we'll see, there's another form of uh, hematopoietic malignancy that also occurs. Skin and alimentary tracts seem to be particularly targeted tissues regarding the lymphoid malignancies in snakes. This is a cobra with a cutaneous manifestation of the tumor. This is a spleen with, uh, uh, with involvement of the spleen, heart, liver. Remember what we said earlier this morning that lymphoid malignancies are multicentric processes. Milk snake with uh, oral manifestation of lymphoma. Uh, note the swelling of the oral weakness membranes. Uh, oral manifestations of lymphoma are common in snakes and need to be differentiated from uh, stomatitis, uh, which can have a similar appearance and is relatively common in snakes. Again, if it's not responding to the treatment, then uh, biopsy would be indicated and that would help in the diagnosis. This is a tortoise with, uh, uh, this is an albatro tortoise with, a, with a, a gut manifestation of lymphoma, uh, showing uh, not only the uh, ulcerated and pseudomembranous surfaces, uh, but also these nostril patterns of the neoplastic infiltrate throughout the gut, uh, throughout the stomach, uh, marked thickening of the mucosa and dislocation, uh, and uh, extensive pseudomembrane formation uh, in areas of ulceration. This is a skin tumor 
showing uh, uh, thickening of the dermis due to the neoplastic infiltrate, uh, tumor in the lung, marked expansion of the interstitium associated with the infiltrate, and high, higher magnification of the tumor in this case, showing that it is a blast cell malignancy. And these are the most common uh, variants of lymphoma in the snakes. Uh, uh, there has not been a lot of uh, work done uh, to further uh, establish the cell lineage for the lymphoid malignancies in reptiles, primarily due to the lack of sensitivity and the reagents that are available to do so. I mean, we, we have used a lot of different uh, immunohistochemical stains to try and identify these tumors. Oftentimes, we will, uh, we will, be, we will uh, be sort of semi-satisfied with uh, CD3 positive tumors, uh, but we have never been able to establish uh, with any confidence that B cell tumors occur. So um, I think that's more likely because we don't have the proper reagents for reptile tissue than uh, the fact that uh, B cell tumors don't occur in reptiles. I'm sure they do. Now, another form of, uh, of uh, hematopoietic malignancy that we see uh, in, in reptiles, and primarily in the boids, is myeloproliferative disease. And uh, this is a mixed cell infiltrate representing uh, the uh, myeloid and erythroid cell components. And it can be uh, uh, just a striking infiltrate of cells, some of which are well differentiated, others are clearly a very early stages in the stem cell line for the hematopoietic cells. Uh, typically, like all uh, hematopoietic malignancies, it is a multicentric process can be associated with substantial organ enlargement. In this particular case, we are looking at the lung of a bullet that has myeloid proliferative disease. We have opened up the lung. Uh, if you recall from some of our, uh, maybe I haven't shown you lung yet, but the lung is a transparent sac, very thin, paper thin, even thinner than that, in normal snake. But this thing, completely infiltrated by this myeloproliferative disease. And histologically, uh, the infiltrate that is in, this here is in the liver and it's completely uh, destroyed the hepatic parenchyma. Uh, but in the liver, a uh, combination of myeloid cells, uh, possibly erythroid cells, and then we've got these large multinucleated cells uh, as well. Uh, they, they don't really have megakaryocytes, so we can't say that those are megakaryocytes and we don't really know what the cell of origin is for those uh, uh, multinucleated cells. A few comments about toxicosis, not too common in snakes. Um, uh, there are only a few reports, most of the reports uh, deal with uh, Organochlorines and so forth in uh, aquatic environments, particularly ocean environments, and uh, associated with uh, biotoxins. There are a few reports of toxicosis in pet or exhibit reptiles. There, there is some information on drug related toxicosis, primarily albendazole and fenbendazole. Uh, this, this drug causes radiomimetic lesions. Uh, in the gut and bone marrow, radiomimetic meaning uh, uh, a toxin that targets the mitotic spindle, and thus those those cells that have rapid replication, uh, such as the bone marrow cells and the epithelial cells lining the uh, villi of the gut, uh, become the product uh, due to the toxicosis, and of course once the Necrosis occurs in the gut, then they become septic because they don't have any bone marrow cells left. They don't have any uh, leukocyte response to a sepsis, and uh, sepsis kills them. Hypervitaminosis D uh, uh, could be considered a toxin, I guess, uh, overzealous supplementation of vitamin D. Uh, possibly ingestion of a rat that was intoxicated with a rodenticide that uh, contained high levels of vitamin D. Also, uh, I think we should include self-envenomation or non-specific envenomation. This is a bushmaster that is biting itself. 
And uh, the uh, when you see a, a, a snake bite itself like this, it's usually a pain-induced response. In other words, it's got some kind of a painful problem in the saloma cavity. It's turning around and biting itself. And of course, that's never a good thing when uh, a snake as venomous as a bushmaster is biting itself in the body. Because there will be a uh, self-envenomation in this case. Occasionally, we also see self-envenomation associated with rupture of a venom gland. The venom glands are large glands, very prominent glands, that are up, up in the facial soft tissues adjacent to the ears. And if uh, the venom gland becomes infected, uh, either due to an ascending, band, uh, ascending inflammatory process of the glands in the ducts, or if the gland becomes ruptured due to a traumatic episode, a bite wound, etc., then these animals will also develop regional necrosis that resembles a, uh, a form of self envenomation or uh, tissue necrosis. This is a gopher tortoise uh, with a swollen face. Uh, and uh, what has happened here is this tortoise. Uh, went down a gopher, uh, uh, went down a gopher hole in Florida. Unfortunately, also in the gopher hole uh, was an eastern diamondback rattlesnake uh, that uh, uh, that didn't uh, like to be bothered by the tortoise and bit it in the head. And uh, uh, this was uh, a fatal bite wound involving. Uh, that altercation, and we can see what usually happens with the uh, rattlesnake bites is uh, there'll be, uh, perhaps if you're lucky, uh, a few small holes uh, uh, strategically located uh, uh, a precise distance apart that corresponds with the fangs, and uh, then there will be uh, a lot of hemorrhage in surrounding tissues and some necrosis and thrombosis, uh, and very typical. Where we see those bite wounds the most actually is in the primates because when they uh, when they are visited by a rattlesnake in their in their in their exhibit uh, they are not too snake uh, knowledgeable and they will get down real close to it and scream at it uh, or they will pick it up about mid body or so and shake it and of course they, you know, as soon as they get their head close to the snake it bites them in the head. And, and what they present as uh, found dead in the morning, and then they've got you know all this necrosis on the in the face and head. Uh, but that's what happened to this tortoise who went down into the burrow and then found a the snake in there, and the snake didn't like that at all, hit it in the head. We talked about fendendazole and the radial mimetic uh, lesions that occur in the gut and bone marrow and secondary sepsis. Uh, it is possible that the empirical doses of fenbendazole that have been published are not acceptable for all species of reptiles. So the administration of this drug as a, as a parasiticide should be uh, done conservatively. This is a phase viper or white-headed viper that was administered uh, toxic doses of fenbendazole inadvertently by the distributor of the snakes. Uh, this is normal mucosa of the gut. What happens here, see, they, they don't have crypts. Reptiles don't have crypts where the epithelium develops. They have uh, development of the epithelium all along the village. Uh, so the basal cell population that uh, reestablishes the epithelial component is all along the whole village. It's not down here in the crypt. So uh, with a radial amenic lesion, all of the basal cells all along the lining of the crypt are going to be taken out. And subsequently, uh, there's going to be no mucosa lining uh, uh, existing after the radial amenic insult. Once that happens, there's a great deal of hemorrhage uh, in the mucosa, and uh, these samples become septic. Uh, at that time, we may also, if we're lucky, find areas of necrosis occurring within the bone marrow, which we have a bone section. Tetrodotoxicosis occurs in, uh, in, in reptiles as well. Uh, this was an inadvertent toxicosis in a, uh, in a uh, caiman lizard that was inadvertently fed a puffer fish. Puffer fish are toxic. Uh, although they're good eating, humans like to eat them. Uh, we also know how to prepare them so that the toxic component of the fish is not present in the, fit, in the food. However, this, uh, this puffer fish 
uh, was uh, in the same tank with a caiman lizard, and the lizard ate the fish. And it didn't take long before uh, this caused uh, substantial toxicosis in the caiman lizard, uh, and unfortunately killed it. So we'll finish up with reproductive diseases. Uh, these are common in females, but are uncommon in males. Dystocia is very common in reptiles, and this can be associated with a number of problems. Uh, environmental problems, perhaps uh, uh, the temperature of the, uh, of the environment is inadequate, uh, the substrate is inadequate for laying eggs, and so they'll hold the eggs, and uh, that creates problems. Uh, there might be nutritional deficiencies, uh, emaciation or hypocalcemia that impair the animal's ability to lay eggs or to contract uh, the opta. Uh, there might be a narrow pelvis due to the developmental anomalies, uh, previous trauma, or previous episodes of metabolic bone disease. Uh, there may be a uh, intestinal mass effect that is uh, interfering with the, uh, with the movement of the uh, of the oviduct and the pelvic inlet. Any salomic adhesions will interfere with contractions of the oviduct and subsequently with folliculostasis or dystocia, that, um, that egg environment is an excellent medium for uh, bacterial oophoritis and they will become uh, Bacterial populations will colonize the oviduct and the, and the ovary, primarily the ovary, and they'll become septic. Or the ovary, uh, the ovary follicle will rupture and will develop nocea virus. Bacterial oophoritis primarily represents hematogenic the spread of a septic process. And this directly relates to dystocia because the eggs provide an excellent medium for bacterial growth and are relatively uh, uh, protected from the immune response in this location, at least until uh, the follicle ruptures. Intermittent low-grade sepsis is common in reptiles, usually due to uh, oral lesions, where they break a tooth when they're eating or something like this. And so intermittent low-grade sepsis is common. Bacteria have a place to go uh, then they can create problems. And the place they usually go is either up into the uh, articulations of the spine or in the females into the uh, yolk follicles. Infected follicles oftentimes will have a red uh, appearance, uh, will be multinosular due to fusion of uh, adjacent follicles. This is a histological appearance. Uh, this is a follicle, this is a uh, yolk material that is being resorbed, uh, and this is an inflammatory response associated with the yolk material. All these little blue areas here represent colonies of bacteria. Subsequent to the rupture of the, of the ovarian follicles, uh, an accumulation of yolk material will be present along cirrhosis surfaces of the viscera. And this can be diagnosed psychologically on this basic field of popular material is yolk material. I think that this yolk material can induce a fair degree of toxemia in the blood because these animals subsequently die related to this and not necessarily due to yolk embolization, although yolk embolization can also occur. Yolk coelobitis in the monitor lizard. Note the, uh, the exudate is present in the saloma cavity associated with the inflammatory changes that are present in the, uh, in the follicles. This is a Louisiana pine snake that uh, ruptured its, uh, its here it is right here, uh, ruptured its oviduct. Uh, and during a dystocian episode, and also developed yolk coelobitis. This is a green turtle with uh, dystocia and oophorosalpingitis. Uh, this is the uh, cloacal region of the, of the oviduct, and, and an egg is lodged in the cloacal region, 
Uh, several other eggs were removed from the open, from the open up, and uh, all of these eggs are in pretty poor shape. They have uh, inflammatory eggs and nail and capsular surfaces. Uh, the, uh, the shell is, uh, is markedly thickened due to the inflammatory exudate. There's uh, considerable inflammation and pseudomembrane formation in the, in the uh, mucosa of the oviduct uh, associated with this process. All of it probably started with dystocia and or bacterial oviritis. And as with, uh, as with the Komodo dragons with the amyloidosis, uh, these animals will sometimes develop yolk emboli, although not always. And death of these animals can, do, can be due to uh, various factors, sepsis, uh, toxemia, and, and of course the yolk, the yolk, the yolk emboli. This is a leopard gecko in which the uh, egg uh, never made it into the cloaca, instead when it went in close to the cloaca and refluxed back into the urinary bladder. And uh, this is a surgical procedure that, uh, that uh, uh, easily performed, egg removed, bladder replaced, no problem. Important things to know which animals have urinary bladders so that uh, anatomically uh, you feel comfortable with what tissue you're cutting into, uh, where the egg really is, and if it's a pathologic process. Because not all of the lizards have urinary bladders, and uh, um, you know, uh, all chelonians have urinary bladders, snakes do not have urinary bladders, but there's a, there's a mixture in the lizards that are those that do and those that don't, and, uh, and the lists are incomplete. Occasionally we'll see cysts in the ovaries, uh, this is a large cyst in the ovary of a tortoise. Uh, this, these are multiple small cysts in both ovaries of another tortoise. These I don't think are going to be problematic. This one could rupture the result of coelomitis. It's so big. And then uh, once in a while, keepers at the zoos will find interesting structures in the zoo exhibits. And they'll submit, and they'll give it to the vet, and the vet will put it in formula and send it in, or they may know what it is right away. Anybody know what this is? This is a, uh, a plug of secretory material following copulation. It fell, you know, the male, in, the male inserts it into the cloaca of the female to keep sperm in the open duct. Uh, this one fell out, see, and it was uh, found on the ground in the exhibit, the keepers sent it in. So well, I get things like this fairly frequently where there's mystery tissue on, you know, on the form. It's mystery tissue, please identify. Because they don't know what it is or whether or not it's pathological or not. Sometimes we'll get mystery tissue that's uh, sloughed mucosa from the colon or something, in which case they're really sick animals they have to deal with. But in this case, it's normal. And that's it for non-infectious diseases of reptiles today. Any questions? Pretty quiet crap. Afternoon. All right. Let's take a break. What do you think? Okay. All right.